Sprint is working on Ocean Protocol, aiming to unlock data for AI to help democratize AI and kickstart an open data economy. He's worked on AI professionally since the late 90s, including machine creativity and AI to help drive Moore's Law, with two startups and a PhD. He's worked on blockchain since 2013, and his hobbies include Nature 2.0, token engineering, and advising governments on blockchain AI, or AIs and blockchain. Thank you. Where is there? Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. My first task is to move this back. I gave a talk once where I bumped this over and there was water on top and there was water flow everywhere, so I'm trying to avoid that here. So, so once again, uh, yes, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it, this is a wonderful movement and um, it's, uh, I'm very happy today to, to share with you um, some thoughts about radical markets and the data economy. Let's get going. So radical markets, um, a bit of background, I mean, this is in the opening pages of, of Glenn's book. Um, Adam Smith, he was a radical in his day. And, um, and you know, a lot of modern economics, not all of it, but a lot of it basically follows um, Adam Smithian type approaches. But rather than following those specific ideas, let's follow the Adam Smith philosophy, which is rethinking property and incentives for the prosperity of society. So basically getting radical. And um, so let's talk a very briefly about prosperity. Y you might ask, um, New York City and a lot of American cities and a lot of the West is very prosperous um, across many dimensions. And compare that to, say, South America, where we have the, the civilizations of the Mayans and the Aztecs, and they are faded, they are gone, even though at their peak they had hundreds of thousands, even millions of people. What went wrong? What happened? And um, the framing from MIT researchers um, uh, in the book Why Nations Fail is the following. It, at the heart, it's really about exclusive versus inclusive government policies. And that's really an ethical choice. Are you basically trying to take advantage of your people or are you trying to get, provide a means for your people to, to work together? And from this initial government policy, it leads to economic institutions, things like, do you have the ability to own property or can the government take it from you? Do you have the ability to, to um, start companies and to grow and to build? And that basically leads to the prosperity of the society. And that's basically the core idea. So ethical choice leads to incentive choice for the people leads to the outcome, whether or not nations or ecosystems are prosperous or not. So um, what's cool is the traditional way uh, of thinking about this was, you know, hoping that it just lays at the level of the government. But we have a new tool, and it's a pretty powerful tool. It's not the only hammer, but it's a pretty new, powerful hammer, and that is a blockchain technology. And blockchain technology allows us to do something very interesting. We can actually um, start with an ethical choice amongst ourselves, which is not only inclusive, but locked open inclusive. Can't. And with that, then, we can create new sorts of economic institutions that manifest incentive machines. So we can have an incentive machine that has a locked, open, pol inclusive policy. With this, then that this can lead to the prosperity of the society or ecosystem. And it's really, you know, it can be a, a nation, it can be within a specific ecosystem across the globe or even very locally, regionally. And it's, you know, all sorts of shapes and sizes here. But this is a new tool where we can basically get radical and rewire our economic institutions with blockchain. So here's one very cool example of this that's been happening over the last 10 years playing out. It started, um, you know, it was sparked in tw 2008 with the, um, the, the financial crisis. And that was building up for years and years and years. And it was really this shadow money economy where you had the Fed, you have the banks and so on. People um, creating these policies that um, prey on the weak, take advantage of it and so on. And they have a lot of power. It's very opaque and so on. And that caused the, the meltdown. Right on the heels of that, what emerged was, was Bitcoin. And Bitcoin sparked what has now become known as the token economy, which is really a transparent, permissionless money economy. And you know, it started with Bitcoin, it moved on to Ethereum and the decentralized financial things that we see today, DeFi. So it's really a, a radical money economy that we've been seeing happening, which is quite exciting, I think, for all of us and uh, here. That's money. 
let's talk a bit about data. Some might say data is the elephant in the room, or maybe more appropriately, it is the whale in the lake. And so, you know, you might not see it um, directly, but it is there in a very big way. We have a problem. Um, data uh, has become, according to many, including The Economist, this is from a May 2017 issue, it has become the world's most valuable resource. We see the likes of Google, Facebook, Uber, et cetera, where they have not only amassed large amounts of data, they also have the AI expertise to convert those large amounts of data into value, and they have ended up being the most valuable companies on the planet by basically this arbitrage of their knowledge of how to convert their arbitrage to the people who can't monetize the data directly, and they take that and they're monetizing it. So data it already is a, an $11 trillion economy. It's about 15% of the world's GDP. In the next five or six years, it's going to hit 25% of the world's GDP. So it is not only big, it is huge, and it's about to get bigger, bigger, bigger. The digital economy is a data-driven economy, and this is stats and quotes directly from the World Bank. So in the vein of radical markets, just as we are inspired by blockchain, kickstarting, and open money economy, let's kickstart an open data economy, leveraging blockchain, a radical data economy. So we have right now, we do have a shadow data economy, right? The likes of Facebook and Google. Facebook itself is buying data from more than 150 da different data feeds, and they're selling it to the likes of Cambridge Analytica um, to you know, basically upset elections, whether they admit to it or like it or not, it's happening. Let's go from that to something, a, a data economy that is transparent and permissionless while preserving privacy. And this is really the vision that we have in Ocean to help kickstart this open data economy. So you might ask, okay, this is the vision, but you know, what does this actually look like? And then how do we get there? And what are, where are we so far? So let's think about what a data economy might look like. To start with, um, because we are inspired by this money economy, this open money economy, well, let's drill into that. What does it look like? It started with Bitcoin, but one model is the following of what it has um, grown into. Uh, you have this base layer, and then you have a utility last mile and an economic last mile. The base layer has um, Bitcoin and others as a reserve currency or a store of value. But it also has an app platform or DAP platform uh, with a unit of exchange to be buying and selling things, and the most prominent among these is Ethereum. And finally, there is actually um, a way to fund these things um, um, at, via ICOs and so on, and Ethereum is, is the most prominent platform there. So this is forming the base layer of this open money economy, this token economy. But on top of that, um, we're actually seeing um, two types of last miles. There's the utility last mile with all of the dApps, the decentralized applications. And I won't get into that, but there's a lot of them and more all the time. Um, and finally, on top on top, there's actually, um, importantly, this economic last mile. And this is really very important because we're talking about this, this open money economy. wallets that you might have living in your browser, things like MetaMask. So um, that's, that's one piece. There's another piece, which is really this emerging DeFi economy. You've got um, token exchanges, you've got stable coins, you've got loans and all these things, things like Uniswap and DAI and so on. And finally, you have the mining, Bitcoin miners and so on. Um, and this is all taken together, the economic last mile. So this is a simplified model, but this is a model of what the token e economy currently looks like. So then we can say, Oh, one more thing. Critically, the token economy, what is the lifeblood of the token economy? Well, it's tokens, of course, right? There's tokens flowing through all of this. Ether and Bitcoin and a thousand other tokens, right? And uh, so that's actually quite critical, too. So then we can ask, what will the data economy look like? Well, one potential answer is maybe it's going to look a little bit like the token economy that has already emerged just five years later, ten years later. So you have this base layer at the, um, where you've got reserve currency store of value, you've got a data, data or asset platform, a unit of exchange, and you've got a data or asset funding platform. Um, in the middle, you have the utility last mile, the different uh, dApps, and on top, you have custodians for data, you have decentralized data exchanges, data as collateral, data loans, all this, and finally, you have mining. So I'm going to drill into each of these, but the core takeaway so far is um, we have this um, 
mirror of the token economy into the data economy. And once again, critically, we have the flow of tokens going through this economy, and, and this is data tokens. We'll talk about that more too. So I've talked about this higher level, like what might this look like? Well, how do we start to implement this? Um, and, and in implementing this, all with our eye on the goal, our eye on the puck, which is all about this radical movement towards opening things up, making it permissionless, helping to change incentives for the prosperity of society. So the core to implement it, there, there's two pieces. There is the data tokens, and I'll talk about that. And there's a blockchain substrate to help power this. And this could be one or many blockchains. Um, and then, of course, you, um, that will um, form the basis for, for these individual pieces. So let's talk, first of all, about this blockchain substrate for implementing this radical data economy. Here's one example that we're working on with Ocean. Um, the heart of this substrate is access control. So the way, one way to think about this is um, at the bottom layer you have data, um, and then you, on the one level above you have a blockchain for basically saying who can see what data. It's sort of this handshaking, um, and it necessarily has to be global, permissionless, and so on. So it's interesting, you actually have um, a permissionless network for data permissions, and this gives you the, the benefits of the security of a public network, but at the same time, where um, you have fine-grained fidel fidelity and control. One level, above, one level above, it's basically the searchability, um, where it's about who can find what data sets and so on. And finally, you have the last mile of the people um, supplying data through data markets, as well as data commons, which is um, basically the price data and the free data taken together. It's sort of a yin and a yang. You can try to go just for a global data commons, but where is the economics for that? Or you could try to go just for data markets, but this might bot tilt things too much for the other direction. So if you say, let's go for both, that's really critical. So this is for the supply of data, and then these can get consumed via data science tools. Um, you know, and this is really the AI bias. Because if you think about, like, why are people buying data today? Why are, where are people using it? Where's the most value? It's in AI, right? This is where Facebook gets its value, Google, Uber, et cetera. It's all about the AI. So the last model then is the AI tools, and there are top tools, you know, things like uh, TensorFlow, which is for deep learning, one of the um, most popular AI algorithms. But not only that, things like Scikit-Learn and Anaconda, all of these different tools that are the bread and butter of the AI ecosystem. So it's really important that you actually have this last mile tools linked to this overall data economy. Um, and it's an example of a front end. Uh, you can go to um, the Ocean Commons at commonsoceanprotocol.com, and you can search for things. You can search for shapes of plants and so on, and you can find data sets related to that. And within that, there's different channels. Uh, for example, there's the AI for Good channel, and this is from one of the initiatives we have, working with the UN, the ITU, XPRIZE, and others, in this uh, overall AI commons about scaling AI for good and there's data sets related to that, and many, many more too. So this is just one example, but of course, the whole idea is this, the, that there are a whole lot of front ends. Now here's a, a, a critical question, maybe we'll just stop here. Um, what we've learned in the two and a half years we've been building Ocean, and of course before that, Big Chain DB, Ascribe, and so on, uh, um, as we've been building it, people said, you know what? What about my private data? What about data that I have that if I give access to anyone, then I lose control? What about my privacy? What about GDPR, all of that? And we, we looked around and we, we thought about this a lot and looked at various technical solutions. And we realized that a very, very pragmatic way to approach this is, well, what if the data never ever leaves the premises? What if you can set things up such that um, the consumer of the data uh, doesn't actually see the data, all they see is the results of it. And the person who holds the data, the actual owner and so on, it never leaves their smartphone, it never leaves their servers, it never leaves their premises. Well, that's a very pragmatic way to do things. So in Ocean, um, we've been building something that, that makes this possible. So you have uh, the person who wants to do the prediction, maybe they supply a modeling algorithm, um, and um, then the, they invoke um, work towards the data, where the data is staying on premise, where basically you've got private data, you train the model privately, on-premise next to the data itself, and then you get this final trained model, that stays on-premise too. And then you use blockchain-based access control, uh, basically sort of as orchestration of the data access and the final results. And all the, the person who um, wants to see the result is, all they see is the result. They don't have to see the model. They don't have to see the data. It's just about the result. So, um, and this is basically a way to have your cake and eat it too, where you can actually get the benefits of accessing private data without actually um, losing control or having concerns about privacy. Um, 
um, basically to give you guys some of the mental models of thinking about all of this, how this might work, um, is some comparisons. So I've talked about Ocean and the stack where there's data at the bottom level all the way up to data markets and data science tools. Uh, well, there's a couple examples um, out there and actually several more um, that are useful. One of them is, is buying flight tickets. So maybe I'll just do an interactive audience thing. Who buys plane tickets? <laughs> Right? Everyone probably, right? Who here uses Kayak or Expedia? Yeah, probably everyone, right? Um, but sometimes, I don't know, um, I know myself, I go to use Kayak sometimes, but sometimes I go straight to EasyJet.com or straight to AirCanada.com. I'm Canadian, eh? And um, so uh, with that, um, I actually like to search on, on Kayak.com for airline tickets if I don't know as well, but if I do know that I'm going to use Easy, EasyJet, I'll go right there. Guess what? The reason I can make that choice is because um, under the hood, they're all looking at the same data. It's something called Sabre, or actually Sabre and Amadeus together. And it's this global database of all the different um, airline flights that are actually um, being put for sale. And then um, uh, Kayak and EasyJet, Expedia, AirCanada.com, they all access this global database, this single database. And then you, you use um, Kayak, EasyJet, et cetera, to, to buy the ticket, and that's what you end up with is the flight ticket that ends up in your hands. So this is very useful because um, it's a, a single overall, um, single global database, if you will, with a handshake and so on, but you have many um, last mile front ends. Another example is BitTorrent. Um, for better or for worse, there are actually many legitimate use cases of BitTorrent. In fact, it was partly built for video game distribution. So with that, it's actually very similar. You have this very thin global network called the, Bit, uh, the BitTorrent network, um, where it stores movie files, hopefully accessed legally, but then you have these trackers for it, the torrent trackers to search them and so on, or video game trackers. And finally on top, you can browse it with things like Kazaa, right? There's other examples out there too. The DNS is very similar. At the top, you have GoDaddy. Um, in the middle, you have um, the DNS and so on and so forth. So um, the point is, this is a very common architecture. You have, um, you have a very thin database along the bottom that has minimal exposure to the privacy. And then one level up, you have the metadata where um, the localized sites are actually taking care of the privacy there. So then going back, you know, popping stack to the higher level, um, in terms of implementing this radical data economy, I've talked about this blockchain substrate, what it might look like. Uh, the other key part is these data tokens, right? Um, and let's ask, well, what does that look like? We all know what um, token tokens look like, you know, crypto tokens, Bitcoin, Ether, we hold them in our wallets. What about data tokens? What does that even mean? Well, the heart of it is that they are for access control to data. So, um, Kind of going back here, we talked about here where we have this access control layer uh, right here, but now we can tokenize that, okay? So tokenizing that means you can now have a wallet, just like you're holding your Bitcoin or your Ether or your CryptoKitties or your tickets to, say, Medicartel Demo Day. Um, side by side with that, now you can be holding <laughs> data. And it's not the heavy data itself of one megabyte or one gigabyte or one petabyte, it's the access to that, which is basically effectively the same thing. Because all of the rights to the data. Um, so you can wrap this in, in a crypto non-fungible token, ERC-721, um, but then also you can transfer it simply by hitting send. So um, it's basically, now the new idea of data management is just simply using crypto wallets. This picture is actually from um, a, a vendor of hardware wallets called Riddle and & Code, and I like them because they're very shiny and pretty and you hear in the suitcase so, uh, um, to manage your, your hardware um, wallet basically. But you can actually go beyond the, the non-fungible, you can actually have it fungible, um, where you can have a limited edition of 10 or 10,000 data tokens, um, where then you can have things like bonding curve pricing and so on, and you can also go um, composing composables, where you can have groups and group, uh, higher and higher, you can group together your data tokens into greater and greater sets. So what are some applications for this radical data economy? Uh, and I'll talk about the, th uh, the various levels. For the data set at the middle, the dApps are really data science tools. I talked about this a bit. Things like Apache Spark or um, Jupyter Notebooks, TensorFlow, all these things. The AI tools. At the very top, um, for the mining, basically mining is really these service networks um, that we uh, see in Web 2 or Web 3, such as uh, storage and compute, like we see for Amazon um, AWS, or, as well as storage and compute in, in the Web 3 world, Filecoin, Enigma, Golem, etc. But this is where things start to get interesting, is this financial last mile, but now it's sort of a data financial last mile. Um, I'm gonna talk about the custodian side of things. So we can have these hardware data wallets, Trezor or Riddle and Code, and now you can actually have enterprise data management with crypto wallets. So rather than these crazy hacks that we see for Equifax and LinkedIn and so on, 
where who knows who controls things? You know, is it um, you know the sysadmin? Is it everyone in the company seeing it? Kind of like the way Facebook was. Uh, who is it now? It can actually be multi-sig among five or ten people in this very secure crypto way. But once you have that, you can start extending it to things like governments. So um, a good prototype for this is how Estonia built its extroid system in 2001. And that unlocked Estonia for having about 30 government applications on top, everything from, from voting to um, <coughs> from voting to legislation to healthcare and so on. And even e-residency, which is a you know one of my favorite government programs on the planet. Um, and that, of course, extends also to smart cities or conscious cities, um, where cities can start to um, manage these, these tokens basically flowing around with, with crypto hardware wallets. And um, then uh, you can also um, think of it as data management for even smaller institutions at the level of one hospital at a time. And you can actually learn um, a, uh, data models across many, many, many hospitals where the data stays at the hospital. So this allows you to, say, build a model to predict Parkinson's. Um, but instead of uh, just, say, 1,000 or 10,000 people in one hospital, it can be hospital one, then hospital two, then hospital three. You can build an AM model across then, you know, 1 million, 100 million people without compromising privacy and without that middleman being centralized as well. So this to me is a super exciting. We can actually really change the face of, of AI modeling in healthcare. Um, there's also the idea of software personal data, and um, this um, we can use data tokens to implement that. Um, you can put it into the browser. Um, then you can get a bit fancier and make it multi-sig, so many people controlling that, that single um, piece of data or many pieces. And of course, what, what Shiv and others and, and Matt talked about earlier today are data unions, right? And uh, this is basically a generalization of multi-sig where you might have 10,000 people, each person with their five or 50 data tokens uh, of their data sets, but then you have this data DAO, this DAO sitting above, this decentralized autonomous organization um, that's controlling all the data below and you can organize it however you want, but hopefully democratically um, according to a, a co-op type rule structure and so on. But there's basically a ton of flexibility now for this. Um, another uh, amazing or super exciting, I should say, um, opportunity is data times DeFi, decentralized finance. So, um, you know, in, in decentralized finance so far, there's non-custodial token exchanges where um, the middleman, Uniswap or Xerox, they don't control the tokens. Well, we can do this for data as well, right? And in fact, we have an alpha running for this right now where basically the middleman data exchange um, can't see the data. It's only the buyers to the sellers. Um, another amazing thing that you can do is buying and selling private data. And that sounds like a paradox, right? But what it comes down to is actually the private data access. And then using this, this trick that I mentioned before, bring compute to the data. Um, then you can also, let's say that you have millions of data sets, but many of them are very, very small. Well, that's OK if you actually have means to add liquidity to these long tail, low liquidity, um, traditional low liquidity with things like automated market makers. Uh, Balancer is a very nice example where it's n tokens at once. Um, we can start to use other radical exchange ideas, uh, such as hard worker taxes, where if you're not sure about what the, the value might be, well, you, you say a value, and then um, you're paying, say, 7% a year for whatever that value is, and people can buy that data set from you, that access, um, at any point in time for the value you set. So this is a very nice balance, obviously explored in, in the radical exchange literature. Another radical exchange um, uh, literature idea is channel auctions, right? Another way to arrive at price where it's um, combining the best of uh, Dutch auctions, which is price going downwards, and English auctions prices going upwards. Um, we can start to have portfolios of data sets um, that you can sell, um, as well as uh, bundles of data and storage and compute all at once. So you know, some compute from Amazon, some compute from Filecoin, all of this bundled together. Um, we can have data tokens in financial supply chains, things like centrifuge tin lake and so on, where um, basically there's this flow of contracts um, tied with the flow of data. Uh, tokenized data insurance, uh, ICOing data sets with bonding curves, um, borrowing data and you're actually paying interest in data itself, or loaning out data and getting interest in data itself. And finally, imagine a stablecoin like DAI, where it's backed by a million data sets. If 25% of the future world economy is going to be based on data, why shouldn't we have currency based on this? So that's a lot. I kind of go went boom, 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 boom. So um, I have, uh, but I, I wanted to kind of give you guys a feel that there's a lot to this future data economy, right? A lot. And there, um, that's the exciting thing. Um, so what I talked about in my talk today is really about an infrastructure to help power this, right? Um, so maybe to wrap things up, I've talked about how blockchain is this new tool to wire economic institutions, including radical ones, right? Where we can have a locked, open, inclusive policy, government or non-government, 
via blockchain-based economic institutions that can lead to new prosperity for our society and ecosystems. So just as we're rewiring the money economy, let's rewire the data economy. To implement this, data tokens are the lifeblood and access control is the heart. We can have non-fungible, fungible, composable data tokens, all of this. Data tokens are the lifeblood, access control is the heart. And then with this, we ha can create and have emerged this radical data economy that catalyzes the prosperity of our society. Everything from buying and selling private data to data unions to maybe perhaps the ultimate where it's data as collateral for stable coins and so on. Uh, with that, I will stop and take questions. Thank you very much. I see Johan smiling. <laughs> Um, I, lo I love how you put data tokens in the middle. I wonder why you haven't mentioned this ERC standard that's called ERC 1948, non-fungible data tokens. Yes, uh, that's a great question. And um, uh, the answer is I wanted to keep it simple for the audience. But uh, we see that um, uh, that could be a very useful. So I just wanted to make it simpler, but definitely, definitely. And there's multiple possible standards, even with the composables. Uh, you know, the most notable one is 998, but there's another the five or six there too, right? So um, which will be the final ones? Maybe all of them, you know, depending on adoption and so on, right? So it's a wonderful thing. Obviously, we've spent time looking at that. And good job with you and your team. <laughs> yes. behind you. There. Thank you. Yeah, so my question is, if you were, if you were training a, a recommender system or a collaborative filtering thing that involved uh, correlating between uh, many different people's uh, uh, preferences or behavior or something, how, how would you do that in this model? So, so that's a great question, Joe. Um, and the quick answer is, um, uh, you're basically talking about you have data silos that are side by side by side, many of them, right, rather than just on one place. So starting a few years ago, there's this new technology in AI com that's been coming out called federated learning, where um, the, the, the AI model is randomly initialized, and then it's updated based on the first hospital, say. Um, it updates the model, and then you go to the second hospital, and you update the model, and third, and so on. And, um, the tr but the problem with traditional federated learning, it decentralizes on the data part, but it's centralized in terms of the orchestration of the learning and centralized in terms of the final model. But what Ocean unlocks is where you can actually decentralize the control of the orchestration. So rather than Google doing all the centralized learning like they did across a million cell phones, you can actually have it manifested in Ocean where no one is controlling that. And finally, you can also decentralize the ownership of this final model. So this is kind of how we see things. This is you know, not something that can get built easily tomorrow, but over the span of the next you know, one year, two years, three years. We do have some prototype work already though too. So it's a great question. Thank you. More questions? Yes. Hi, thanks, Trent. Um, my name is Maria. I was just wondering whether behind all this, there's an assumption that um, people are aware or at least competent on how to, um, for example, this data on premises, how to use this. Yes. And I'm wondering what is the share of actually data generators that can be involved in this without um, training them or, so, or b without being them aware, making them aware of what they're doing? Yeah, so th that's a, a great question. And what I focused on was a lot of the back-end infrastructure. I didn't focus on UX, but UX is absolutely critical. And I see it where um, there's a few different wa ways. Um, it, it really comes down to these last mile providers where it could be simply an app where you're um, going into um, the app itself or in the permissions on your iPhone or whatever and saying, I give permission for this or this or this, right? Um, just like, uh, you know, there or even in, um, other applications, Facebook has given fine-grained permissions because the government made them, <laughs> basically. Um, so this is what I see as, as the final cases. I also see, see though, things like um, data unions or um, data cooperatives as very useful because then you're delegating a lot of the thinking of the responsibility to one level up, one level up. So you know that if you're um, delegating, you know that the people who are more in charge, the people governing the data union, 
um, you have your vote, but they're taking care of the, the details of this, right? And data and unions and co-ops can get to very large scale. I come from rural Canada uh, in Saskatchewan, where um, it's, it, it had one of the largest cooperatives in the world, the Saskatchewan Wheat Pool, where tens of thousands uh, of farmers um, were part of this co-op, and they had collective bargaining to sell their wheat to Japan and the rest of the world. I can see a similar thing here. You know, farmers, the farmers didn't have to think about finding some buyer for bread in Japan or for wheat in Japan. They delegated to the Saskatchewan Wheat Pool to take care of it. So I see a similar thing here emerging. Um, and, uh, and Ocean then is really about providing this infrastructure to make it easier for those last mile builders to work with APIs, data tokens, this sort of thing. Um, so in this model, one of the main stakeholders is the sort of data scientists and systems engineers who are going to consume and turn this into sort of real world value. What are you guys doing to sort of uh, push on that part of this ecosystem? Uh, yeah, so um, quite a few things. I, I think overall, um, I, I come from the world of AI, so in a sense, I'm uh, even Ocean, you know, I, I have very, um, I have ideas of things that I want to build with Ocean, um, so that helps, but uh, we have um, been building things like integrations with, with Jupyter Notebook. We actually have something called Manta Ray that you can find on data science at oceanprotocol.com, where it's basically uh, Jupyter Notebooks playing well with Ocean. And then we're working very closely with um, data scientists um, in various domains. For example, I briefly mentioned the AI Commons. And uh, in that case, AI Commons, one of its initiatives is something called ImpactNet, which is a set of benchmarks towards uh, AI benchmarks for AI researchers that are tuned towards four good initiatives, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So we're working closely um, in, in that domain uh, as a way to connect to those last mile data scientists. Um, so whenever you're, a, if you're an AI researcher and you're publishing a paper to a top AI conference like NeurIPS or KDD or whatever, then you're going to be using one of the, you're going to be um, working on one of these benchmarks and Ocean is helping to, to um, manifest and, and store these. So, so that's one example. Um, another one, I guess, is Anaconda. We work closely with Peter Wang, the founder of Anaconda, which has 10 million users doing data science. We have time for one more question. You, I, I, thank you for your talk. So um, my background is also in machine learning, but I see a lot of data, but I don't see the annotations. So. And from the, in this concept, I don't see something about data refinement, how to take the data and add the labels, for example, to it. Do you have a concept here? I do, actually. And in fact, probably the easiest is just to, to go to the picture. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. Here. So um, Ocean, um, it's not just data access control. It's actually access to control to services and including orchestration. And we needed it to pull this off. So Ocean basically is saying, you set up this, 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 and this whole compute DAG, and Ocean is orchestrating that compute. So you can have raw data, but then you can also have you know, raw data going through compute to more data, more data, more data, so refining, refining, refining. And so Ocean, um, you can be storing the private trained model in Ocean as well, right? So it's actually helping to orchestrate this. And then with things like data annotation, you might have some unannotated data, and then you might go through some um, human-powered data labeling service, for example, right? And then um, also, though, if people want, they can take some raw data, and then they can use something like ERC-998 bottom-up composables in order to attach annotations to that, with, we, even without asking permission, in a sense, right? So there's quite a few ways to, to use Ocean um, to, for this, and it's absolutely critical. You know, uh, there's tons of data out there that's raw data that has no value, that it's open, and the real value starts coming when you add labels, when you start doing cleaning, and so on. So it's a great question. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you.